The brutal death of a child beauty queen, a town bombarded by blobs from the sky, and the biggest rap mystery of an entire generation. These cases have grown cold, but they're still raising questions. Amber Hagerman was nine years old in 1996 when she rode her bike in the parking lot of a grocery store just a stone's throw from her grandmother's home. She would have had no idea that her life was about to come to a tragic end. A single witness came forward saying that they'd seen someone driving a truck grab Hagerman off her bike. Arlington 911, what are you reporting? Yeah, I, I saw a, a black pickup and he grabbed a little girl and he took off toward town with her. The local Arlington, Texas Police Department was on high alert. Her kidnapping was covered by national media outlets, but in the end, it didn't matter. Her body was recovered four days later. She'd been killed and dumped in a creek. In 2021, police issued another appeal for new information, and Cairo 7 News reported that there still may be a good chance for justice. Police had DNA from the cold case and were going to be making yet another attempt to take advantage of new technologies to try to find a match. As tragic as Hagerman's disappearance and death was, a considerable amount of good has come from it. After her murder, broadcasters and law enforcement worked together to create the Amber Alert System. In addition to being adopted across the U.S., the Amber Alert System is also in use in Europe, where 18 countries use it to notify the public of missing or kidnapped children. In just 81 minutes, on March 18, 1990, two people walked into the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, restrained the two guards on duty, and stole around $500 million worth of art. One piece alone, one of only about 34 surviving paintings by Johannes Vermeer, was worth a whopping $250 million. Other stolen works included Rembrandt's Christ in the Storm on the Sea of Galilee, a few other Rembrandts, some sketches by Edgar Degas, and strangest of all, the museum's most valuable painting by Titian was left behind. In spite of the fact that the museum continues to offer a $10 million reward to anyone who comes forward with information that helps them recover the paintings, not a single work has yet been recovered. Clues, however, are still lingering. In 2021, NBC Boston reported that a then-local jeweler had come forward with testimony that one longtime suspect, Bobby Donati, had approached him with one of the pieces stolen in the heist. That report came on the heels of the death of another suspect, Robert Gentile. Gentile had connections with the mob, but always denied that he had anything to do with the theft. The museum has never removed the empty frames where the 13 stolen pieces once hung, and they remain as a reminder of one of the decade's biggest mysteries. On December 6, 1991, emergency responders rushed to put out a fire in a yogurt shop in Austin, Texas. Once the flames were out, they were shocked by what they saw, the remains of four girls. The teenagers had been tied up, shot, and left in the building as it was set on fire. Any evidence that may have been left behind was destroyed in the blaze, and investigations led nowhere until four men were arrested in 1999. But although the men confessed, they later said they were innocent and had only confessed under interrogation. The two who had been convicted had those convictions overturned on appeal, and the case remains unsolved. Law enforcement believed from the beginning that multiple people were involved in the deaths of 13-year-old Amy Ayers, 15-year-old Sarah Harbison, and 17-year-olds Jennifer Harbison and Eliza Thomas. Leads came and fizzled, and the case dragged on. Still, there's a chance this may be solved someday. In early 2022, CBS News reported that one of the victims had been sexually assaulted and the fire hadn't destroyed DNA evidence. Recovered along with the rounds from the weapons used, the hope is that advances in DNA technology will allow law enforcement to finally get a match and bring the killers to justice. Once my life is gone, it's gone. Can't nobody give it back to me. Not the judge, not the president, not the governor. They can't do nothing but come to my funeral and talk pretty. It was right after Mike Tyson put an end to a fight in 109 seconds on September 7, 1996, that Tupac Shakur was caught on camera for what would be the last time. He was walking through the MGM Grand when he saw a gang member that had a previous altercation with one of his death row record associates. And the following fight was over quickly. Shakur walked away and was shot two hours later as he sat at a stoplight. Shakur died six days later of four gunshot wounds, and no one was ever arrested. There are a ton of theories about just what went down that night, and as the journalist, filmmaker, and producer of the series Who Killed Tupac, Stephanie Frederick explained to the Las Vegas Review-Journal, There's too many dirty details, too many people who will come under fire, too many secrets that will probably get out that shouldn't be out. There's so many entanglements. And there were a ton of witnesses. Shakur was, at the time he was shot, sitting in a line of cars filled with what was described as his death row entourage. While they all would have seen the white Cadillac and the shooter, everyone has refused to talk. Law enforcement places a lack of arrest squarely on the shoulders of the silent witnesses, and the killing remains unsolved. June 16, 1991 was like any other day at the United Bank Tower in Denver, Colorado, until it wasn't. That was the day that an armed man went into the bank, shot and killed four security guards, and left with around $200,000 in cash. The following year saw a massive trial broadcast across the nation. 
James King was a retired Denver police officer and had worked as a security guard at the bank before he was arrested for the killings and the theft. There were a lot of strong feelings around the trial, with some pointing to the fact that there was no actual evidence that it was him as a major red flag, while others were convinced that he was definitely the guy. King was ultimately acquitted, but until his death in 2013, he remained under constant surveillance by the FBI and under just as constant suspicion. In 2021, the Toronto Sun did a refresher on the case and noted that there was still no official verdict. In spite of the evidence being circumstantial at best, law enforcement still claimed that the right guy had gone free, but not everyone is convinced. 2021 saw the 25th anniversary of one of the highest profile murder cases in the country, the death of six-year-old John JonBenet Ramsey. Initially believed to be a kidnapping, police were called after Patsy Ramsey found a ransom note asking for $118,000 for her daughter's safe return. Police went to the house, and hours went by, a full eight hours. And that's when one detective told Ramsey's father, John, to look around the house to see if he noticed anything odd. When he went into the basement, he found his daughter. She had been strangled, beaten, and wrapped in a blanket. What followed was what could accurately be described as a media feeding frenzy, and the bottom line is that no one was ever brought to justice for the little girl's death. The list of suspects was a long one. It included both of her parents, who were officially exonerated, along with her older brother, Burke, who has maintained his innocence. Did you hit your sister over the head with a baseball bat or a flashlight? Absolutely not. Other suspects include a convicted sex offender and drifter named Gary Oliva, and a local electrician, both of whom were cleared on the basis of DNA. Then there was a teacher who gave a confession that was ultimately deemed false, their housekeeper, whose involvement was based on only circumstantial evidence, and a local man who dressed up as the town's Santa. Rolling Stone called the idea of his involvement the sensationalized character assassination of a friendly old man. John Benet Ramsey's murder remains unsolved. Not all unsolved mysteries involve murder, so let's look at one that's just downright weird. On August 7, 1994, residents of Oakville, Washington woke to a strange sight. Overnight, weird gelatinous blobs had fallen from the sky and covered everything. They weren't just gross, reports the BBC Science Focus, they were also dangerous. Ah! 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 Residents blamed the blobs for the flu-like sickness that quickly started making the rounds. Doctors recorded higher than normal instances of inner ear problems, major respiratory problems, and vertigo in the days after the event. Some, like Beverly Roberts, suffered such bad vertigo that she had to crawl to her car to make it to the doctor. She was hospitalized for a week. Everybody in the whole town came down with like a flu, only it was a really hard flu. It didn't last like seven days. It lasted like seven weeks, to two or three months. Even more disturbing were the deaths of any animals who happened to eat the jelly. They died almost immediately after ingesting the substance. Death came with vomiting green foam, and scores met this tragic fate. There's never been a satisfactory explanation for what the jellies were, and yes, they've been analyzed. The results cleared up absolutely nothing. The official results from the Washington Department of Health said that the blobs contained illness-causing bacteria, but weirdly, none of the illnesses any of the victims suffered, along with white blood cells of human origin. No one has any idea what was going on. Employees at the Las Cruces Bowling Alley were getting ready to open on February 10, 1990, when two men forced their way in and told the manager, Stephanie Sinek, her 12-year-old daughter and her daughter's 13-year-old friend to get on the floor. After another employee, Steve Turan, walked in with his two- and six-year-old daughters, the killing began. Turan and his daughters were killed instantly, and although Sinek survived, she later died of complications. Amy Hauser, 13, was also killed. The two men left with somewhere around $5,000 and were never caught. Law enforcement and the families of the victims are still hopeful that they might be brought to justice someday, because while there was no DNA evidence recovered, there were plenty of fingerprints. Turan's brother Anthony is pretty sure they won't see justice. He told the Las Cruces Sun News, I can almost guarantee that those two guys are dead. By their lifestyle, because if you can shoot a six-year-old and a two-year-old in the forehead, you can do anything. Nothing's going to bother you. Between 1993 and 1998, women disappeared from an area of Ireland that was given the name of the Vanishing Triangle. The points of the triangle were in the counties of Wexford, Louth, and Offaly, and within the bounds of these points, at least eight women vanished, some in broad daylight, and were never seen or heard from again. Remains have never been discovered, and according to what writer Claire McGowan found when she wrote a book on the cold case, it's not even clear just how many women there are. The usual number is eight, and their stories are varied. Deidre Jacob, for example, vanished from just outside of her home in the middle of the afternoon. Ciara Breen was 17 when she vanished one night, and Annie McCarrick was an American student last seen at a pub in the Dublin Mountains. McGowan found others that fit the same profile, 15-year-old Arlene Atkinson from Castle Dirk, for example. McGowan suspects a serial killer. 
She told the Irish Times, I have a hard time believing that each of these missing eight women was murdered by eight different men. I think some of them were done by the same person. Without remains, though, that's made it tough to connect the victims or even start trying to compile suspect lists. There have never been any arrests or trials, but they haven't been forgotten.